Silverstone Race Circuit. It's not often this quiet as the home of the British Grand Prix and the Jim Russell Race School. We're here to chart the progress of seven people through the International Race School programme. It means five days of intensive training for a mixture of complete beginners and racers already on their way up through the ranks. Regardless of where they start, at the end of the week they all hope to be good enough to take part in and finish a race to win their racing licence. But as is so often the case, before the excitement can begin, there are a few formalities to go over. OK, a couple of things. Uh, this morning is obviously always chaos, all right? It's very, very difficult to do it any other way because if you give people individual time segments to arrive at 9.10, 9.20, 9.30 and so far, they never turn up and it becomes absolute chaos, all right? So unfortunately today, this morning is a pain on the arse, I'll admit you've got to sit around for quite a bit, but we'll get going from now on, all right? A couple of things before we go anywhere. The timetable in your programs is going to change quite dramatically during the week, right? Depending on weather conditions, and so far, and if we have any accidents and so forth, which we will not have at this stage, all right? As if they needed reminding that they're about to take part in a dangerous sport, our eager pupils are faced with a barrage of medical and insurance forms to complete. After that, it's time for a comprehensive series of medical examinations, starting, of all things, with a colour vision test. So what I want you to do is just read the numbers for me. 12, 8, 29, Great. 5, Three. Good. 15. 74. Good. Six. They must pass this. A driver has to be able to determine which coloured flags are being waved out on the track. L N E T H D A. OK, now the other side. A O H T E N. Race driving is a very physical activity. The forces acting on the driver's arms and shoulders are significant, and so strength is important, right down to the fingertips. Keeping a good grip on the wheel under pressure could make a winner. Some of the more tried and trusted methods are used when it comes to testing hand-eye coordination. It may look odd, but it's essential. Zipping on a race suit for the first time sets the adrenaline pumping. Our drivers are issued with everything they need to compete. This isn't just about comfort, it's about safety too. Ordinary trainers have to be left behind in the pits and swapped for proper race shoes, narrow enough to fit into the tight confines of a racing car and with thin soles to allow for plenty of pedal sensitivity. It's brilliant because at the end of the week I can actually do a race as well as have five days of tuition and, and help with my racing. I didn't want to do just a single day because I thought it would be more fun to spend a couple of days learning really in depth about, about racing and what I should be doing in the classroom and also practicing on the track. This week I'm generally looking to uh, have a good laugh, pick up some speed and I just want to go around the track as fast as I can without coming off basically. Well I did a half day lesson at Donington when they were based there last year and I decided that you know once I'd actually sat in a car and driven a couple of laps in it I thought that's what I want to do as a hobby. Well what kind of single seaters do our pupils learn to race in? Well this is a Zeus Formula Ford 1600. It's got a top speed of 110 miles per hour and it goes from 0 to 60 in four and a half seconds. It also has 110 brake horsepower. Now because the chassis only weighs 500 kilos, it's got a very strong power to weight ratio. Question you may ask is how do you get into this thing? I'll show you how. Hmm. Well not quite so comfortable actually. As you would imagine, it, all our pupils come in different shapes and sizes so each car is adjusted to fit perfectly so that there's no extension of the feet or the arms to try and reach the pedals and the controls of the car. And those controls are, as in any standard car, you've got the brake, accelerator and clutch. On the instrument panel, we've got the oil and water temperature here, as well as a large rev counter, which shows very clearly um, the revs um, per minute. Um, pupils on the first days of the course are kept to a strict limit of 4,000 revs and it builds up progressively over the week. On the left hand side we've got the ignition switch and the starter button. On the right hand side we've got the switch for the rear light, which in the event of rain or very dark weather the, the pupils need to really put, switch on that rear light. Now we're surrounded by a very strong tubular space frame chassis that in the event of any accident would protect the driver very well indeed. 
The other option for pupils is to go for a touring car. This is a standard Vauxhall Vectra 2.5 litre V6. Extra safety features include a fire extinguisher, race harness and roll cage that also stiffens the chassis. Good news in a race car. Have you got any intentions to follow up the course with doing a race car championship or anything? If I do well, I'd rather hope to do well. Um, yeah, I've, I've got intentions to move on to uh, the, uh, the next series on from the race. Yeah, I'd like to go on and do something like the, maybe the British Championships in Formula Ford or possibly Junior Vauxhall. I'm going to uh, more likely be in South Africa, but um, if I can speak to a couple of people here and see it, you know, if, if I can further my career, um, you know, I'm more than willing and um, you know, it, it, it'll take a little bit of time and, and see where we go. Hunter, quite unusually as a cartist, you're choosing a career, even at this early stage, only 18, of pursuing a career in touring cars, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Um, at the moment, I see touring cars as uh, the place to go, it's most exciting racing. And at the moment, there's, so many, there's a lot of change going on with the touring cars, because it's really a make or, make or break for the touring car se series itself. Okay. So um, hopefully, they'll be able to sort it out and making a dif big difference with it. Our first group of students are off to a fitting session. Driving any single-seat race car means more than hopping in and sliding the seat about until you're comfortable. Like a good suit, the car has to be fitted to you. And it's a tight fit. There's not much room to manoeuvre inside, but getting everything in the right place is critical if the driver is to keep control and to feel everything that the car is doing underneath them. Measurements are taken and recorded for the distance from the pedals and steering wheel and the process goes on until the instructors and mechanics are happy that they've got it right. OK, Hunter, your first car fitting, how was it? Uh, I was a bit surprised actually, it's, um, it's very comfortable. But I was surprised about the travel on the pedals, because right. on the clutch pedal it's especially short. It's only literally got that much travel on it, whereas with a car you're talking sort of this much. You're a big lad, um, how did you actually feel in the confines of a single seat or a cockpit? I was very surprised actually, yeah, because um, I was thinking it was going to be very, very tight, but actually it wasn't too bad at all. Today what we're doing is heel and toe, which is, so if you want to, when you actually brake, you want to be right on the edge of this pedal here, okay, so when you're on full brake, you flick your heel, like that, that's it, perfect. Of course, not everyone has a problem finding space in a small car, and the mechanics have to allow for all sizes. Indeed, for some drivers, even in here, there's too um, much space. What I can do is I can bring the pedals out of touch. Um, a little bit different compared to carts I'm used to, you know. It's an extra pedal in there, whereas carts is just breaking throttle, but uh, it's all right. I saw them adjusting the pedals. What was, what was going on there? I've got small feet, so... Right. I had trouble actually healing the toe. The stuff of dreams it may be as yet, but even at the very top, this is an essential process. Damon Hill checks out the fit in his 1999 Jordan Formula One car. Well, we've been trying to get the dimensions and uh, measurements for next year's car so that I've got a good driving position, but also that, so that the engineers can optimise all the other space available in the car. The shoulder distance is, is too close, and that means um, it's closer to the top part of my legs. So it fouls, fouls on my legs when I do that. So I can't drop it. So it might be, if I, if I can get further back, I might be able to bring it back with me a bit and drop it. And that might give me more clearance there. Well, first thing you have to do is be able to see where you're going, which might sound uh, like a glib thing to say, but actually um, it's quite tricky to, to um, to get the balance between getting your head down in the car um, where the, the, the airflow is, is best for the air, air intake for the engine and also to be able to see where you're going because uh, we're almost lying flat on our backs. So it might be, the best thing might be to actually put the bulkhead where you can feasibly put it and, and bung a bag in and then I can get my seat, see if I can get my seating position yeah. right from there. Right, is this stable? You're going to hold this? Yeah. Otherwise I'm going to have a big shunt in the, in the factory. OK. So this is actually different to my current seating position, is it? No, it's not. What I'm trying to achieve is something a bit more like that. Now, right now, my hips are too wedged against, the, um, against that. 
Everything has to hinge around that point yeah. where my head hits the headrest because um, that determines whether you're going to sit like this, you know, yeah. or whether you're going to be in, in, in a more ideal position. Being with my hips this far forward, I then have quite a lot of bend on my knees, my legs, if you like. I'd rather have, I'd like to have my legs stretched further. It's nothing like a road car seat. I mean, a road car seat uh, is a very comfortable, obviously. That's the, the main criteria. You have to be able to um, uh, get some springing effect in the seat, in a road car seat. Well, well our, our seats don't have any soft um, padding in them at all. They're, they're, they're molded to the, to the shape of our backs and, uh, and uh, our backsides. And uh, basically, we just sit there on this very, very hard um, shape. But it's actually because it, because it is your shape, and it moulds around your body, it actually supports your, your body quite well and you, you spread the load that way. Even when preparing a Formula One car, the process is the same, but some of the techniques used are different. A technician prepares a complex mix of chemicals. Meanwhile, exact measurements are taken at critical points on Damon's body to make the basic frame of the seat. When it's time for the fitting, the mixture is poured into a bag placed between Damon and the seat shell. Then all he has to do is sit and wait whilst the liquid forms to his exact shape and finally sets to make a solid mould from which a perfectly fitted seat is created. The effort put into this by the team is a measure of how important it is. In a three hour race being comfortable matters as does being held very firmly in place. Getting out too early now would spoil the shape of the seat and ruin the mould. But with care and patience, the resulting seat will fit Damon like, well, a glove. Well, I'm very uh, happy about the way things are going. It's coming good again. I think that we're going in the right direction. And um, they work very hard here at Jordan to, to give me a car that I can uh, work with. And uh, so I'm very happy. What do your um, family and your friends think about you, your karting career? Um, I think they, they do back me all the way. But with my friends, it's a bit frustrating for them because I'm only around sort of once every other weekend and things. And, um, well, basically, I'm not around all the time. Whereas a lot of them sort of go out to pubs and clubs and things and not entering that much because obviously the racing career and things. And the fitness side of the point of view, you have to be very fit for the sort of karting which I'm doing, which is Formula A. Right. So you're pulling two to three Gs, so you have to be very, very fit for it. Karting is really the grass roots of motorsport. Nearly everyone who is on a Formula 1 grid now, I think it's 90%, actually started their racing careers in karts. Many of the drivers on the Formula 1 grid started in European Championship karting, either from the age of 8, which you can start from, or slightly older. Most people start around 12 in the cadet class, then go up through the ranks, through juniors, and then into seniors. This is a junior intercontinental A car. The engine is two-stroke, which all formulas of racing in karts are, apart from pro karts. This, this one's putting out roughly about 20 brake horsepower at 16,000 revs. Most of the people run around 16, 17,000 revs maximum. Um, it's the quickest junior formula there is, and it's a very, very good learning curve, especially if you want to go into senior racing at British or European Championship level. My name is Bobby Game. I look after the kart setup. Uh, we go quite a bit of testing. We go to races up and down England. Uh, we go to Europe, anywhere that takes us really for the CIK events. Uh, the tyres that we use in England are slightly harder than we use in Europe, and in Europe the tracks are a bit more abrasive and tend to, you know, grip up a lot more. With the engines, obviously there's different engines for different classes. For the juniors, they use this type of engine, which is a piston port engine with a clutch fitted. So it's a lot easier for the drivers if they have any spins, and they can just you know, put the foot down and go again. These engines will last a little bit longer than the senior engines, basically because they don't rev so much. These are revving to about 17,000 maximum and will be rebuilt every two hours. Uh, once they're rebuilt, they'll have a piston, 
bottom ends checked over, so maybe have main bearings, you know, depending on, on the stage of its life really. Uh, they have to be run in each time they're rebuilt. They have to be run in for approximately 20 minutes and then you've got the two hours on top of that. For the senior classes, the engines are revving up, up to 20,000 revs. They don't do it every track. They produce a little bit more top end speed, which is at the end of the straights, uh, which means they need to be rebuilt slightly sooner. They, they would normally be rebuilt every hour. Karting's been fantastic for me. I've learned so much. I couldn't have learned anywhere near as much if I've been racing cars since I started. I've learned so much about overtaking and racing driving. You just gain so much more experience than you could possibly in cars for half the cost. Now, for me, I think it's the right time to make the move into car racing. I'm 19 now. It's about the right time for me. Everybody else seems to do it by that age. So Next year, I'll be racing in the Lotus Sport Elite Challenge, which will be running across Europe and in Britain. In Britain, it's running with the BTCC, so all the top teams will be there, and hopefully I might get spotted by one, because BTCC and GT1 is where I want to go. And what do you, your friends and your parents think about you coming on the course? At first it was, oh, you're mad, that's so much money, but... Mm. Um, you know, I think a lot of them, they want to come up and see the race on Sunday. I think they're behind me now. Right. You know. And what about your mates? Because I understand your mates did the half day, a few of your mates did a half day course as well. Yeah, one of the, one of the guys I worked with, he did the half day. But, mm. um, Are they a little bit jealous that you've been able to come and do this? or? I don't know if they're jealous mm. of me doing it. I think more uh, they weren't willing to shell out the money, you know, right. to have a good laugh. And what do your um, family and your friends think about you? Well, they're happy that I'm going to learn to do it properly rather than trying to teach myself on the road, I think. Heel and toe is a technique used in motor racing to help balance the car at all times. All the way through this week, you're going to hear us talk about balance all the time. All right? It's the most essential part of being in control of the car. You controlling the car, not the car controlling you. All right? What we're going to do is a nice simple exercise First off to start, we're going to go out in the hangar straight, okay? And basically we're going to go onto a loop, okay? Nice, simple cone loop. We're going to start with saloons and then it'll be single seaters back to back, all right? What I'm going to ask you to do is when we get out here, we're going to drive up the loop in a clockwise direction, all right? We're going to stay in single file. There will be no overtaking, okay? It's one piece of road. Obviously, if you start overtaking each other, you can have a 180 mile an hour head on impact, which I'm not very happy about. And so to work. After all the preparations, lessons can begin, and it's time to learn about balance, the key to success in any racing discipline. It's the first time some of these young racers have driven a single-seater, and they begin with cornering practice and an introduction to the art of heel and towing. It means applying pressure to the brake pedal to slow the car, whilst rocking the side of the foot onto the throttle pedal and blipping it during down changes. Easy. Done correctly, it matches the engine speed with the speed of the road wheels, keeping the change smooth and allowing the car to keep its balance. The touring cars might be bigger and heavier than the single-seaters, but balance is no less important if the car is to be controlled under racing conditions. Hi David, 
first experience out there on the track. I know it's been a specific exercise, healing and towing. How was it for you? What problems did you come across? It was very different to what I've done before, and it was just completely a different mindset altogether. I kept putting my, kept my heel on the floor, and so I tried to rock my foot from there, and it was very uncomfortable. It wasn't possible. So the instructor Eddie, I believe, came in, so I should lift my heel and roll it from the, the pedal across to the throttle a lot more. I got the hang of that. I like to think and it seemed to go a lot better, and I felt a lot more confident as the laps went on. I could have done that all day. Okay, Clinton, um, first time out at Jim Russell today, um, accomplished race yourself, so a bit of a formality shouldn't it have been for the healing and towing exercise? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty, um, you know, something that I use, uh, you know, while I'm racing and all that, so it's, it's nothing new to me, but it's, it's nice to you know, practice and, and, and get to know it. We had a bit of practice there, so it's, it's, I'm quite comfortable with it now. Okay, Pippa, first time in a single seater, how was it for you? Um, a little bit strange. The gearbox is really different to a car. It's a little dog box, and I was really struggling to find the right gears. Um, it's lots of fun, though. I like, I like when you go really fast, your helmet starts creeping out of place. It's good fun. Okay, Darren, fresh back from the, um, the exercise on healing and towing, how did you get on with the magic art of healing and towing? I um, found it pretty difficult, to be honest. Um, car seemed to keep leeching, um, lurching forward all the time but um, I think I was picking up towards the end. I need a bit more practice but I'll get there. The only problem I had was I couldn't actually hit the accelerator all the time but I'm going to be adjusting the car later on just to move the accelerator a bit nearer to the brake pedal. Next week, the pupils get a first drive on the Stowe Circuit, the main training circuit for the Jim Russell Race School. The view should provide inspiration. It's actually inside the international circuit. They'll get more lessons on the track in the Formula Fords. They'll also get a practical lesson in skid control and get to let their hair down on the skid pan.